Hello, welcome to this session. This is a little bit unusual. I thought I'd be at the conference. Then everyone was told um, it's going to be from home. And then when I was prepared to do a, a conference session from home, I got a call from my father that he needed me there. So I'm actually doing this talk from my childhood bedroom, which is kind of unusual, but it's a good room actually related. This is where I met my first computer and it's still around. <laughs> so this is where I have my current computer and my first computer together for the first time in a long time. Yeah, I guess most people who are interested should be in by now, so we can get started. This talk is obviously going to be about tool chains and cross compilers and what has changed because not everything is the same it used to be some 20 years ago. So the current situation when it comes down to uh, tool chains, cross compilers and everything is that there's one really well known, well documented, uh, slightly complicated way to build it all which is, of course, uh, get binutils, get GCC, get glibc, build them all in the right order and build them again to, uh, to get all the features. Uh, we'll get back to that in a bit. And there's also a couple of alternatives, but not a lot of people are aware of them or not a lot of people have used them. And they're certainly not as widely known as the traditional way. And we're going to take a look at uh, what those alternatives are where it makes sense to use them and where it makes sense to stay with the traditional way of doing things. So the best known way is obviously to grab binutils, then GCC, build a minimal GCC compiler for your target platform that has only seen uh, no threads, probably no support for shared libraries. And then you build glibc and then when you are done with that, you build GCC again, enabling a few more features, including libstd C++ if you want C++ support, including threading and all the other advanced compiler features you may need. LTO is another thing that's usually not in the first stage compiler. And of course, this approach still has some advantages. It's by far the most widespread. Most of the first uh, third party libraries and applications have been tested in this setup. It's what's at the core of almost every, at least desktop distribution or server distribution out there. Some embedded devices have gone another way already, but most of those devices are devices where you don't actually get to look uh, at what they're doing. And of course, along with that uh, comes the fact that people you are talking to on IRC mailing lists forums have done this and will be able to help you out with any problems there. You will probably also find people to help out with alternatives, but they may be a bit harder to find. So let's take a look at what some of the alternatives are. First, you will need a compiler, which is GCC in the traditional option. Mm. There's one compiler that is equally good, which is Clang, which comes from the LLVM suite. Mm. LLVM also has replacements for binutils, so you can uh, skip the binutils step as well. In LLVM, before version 10, that was a bit complicated because the linker that came with it just wasn't good enough and couldn't replace LD. But in LLVM 10, that has changed. You can build pretty much everything with LLD these days. So if you're opting for Clang, you don't really need binutils anymore. Oh, and before I forget, there is the Q&A session the, uh, that you can see. It In the default setup, it's under the video window. Feel free to type questions there at any time. Interrupt me when you feel like it. I can't guarantee that I'll notice it immediately, but I'll try to answer questions in a timely manner. Okay, back to the topic. Yeah, LLD has become good enough to replace binutils. So instead of compile binutils and then compile GCC, you can opt to just compile LLVM and Clang. Mm. 
one of the interesting things about Clang is that it's a cross compiler by design. So with GCC and a lot of other compilers, you have to build the compiler once for every target you want to support. Whereas Clang can be built for any supported platform at the same time. So unless you want to, uh, you don't build uh, all the platforms at the same time. You, you don't build different compilers for all the platforms. You just build all the targets you want into one Clang compiler and then you specify Clang dash target uh, with the triplet you want to support and then the same version of Clang will build the uh, binary for whatever architecture you're targeting with the dash target switch. Another advantage of Clang is that its uh, code is a lot easier to get into than GCCs. So if you are interested in hacking on the compiler itself, but you are not already a GCC expert, it is much easier to get started in the Clang world. So we have a question on the channel, which is the, which is better with respect to time between GCC and Clang? That is a question that is hard to answer because it kind of depends on the code you are using it on. There used to be the situation that in general, Clang would be much faster at compiling things, but GCC would produce faster binaries. That has changed a bit uh, as uh, Clang has been adding more optimizations. It uh, got a lot slower at compiling things, but the binaries got a lot better. So these days I'd say they are roughly the same speed, both at compiling and at uh, running the stuff that was compiled. I hope that answers the question. If not, uh, please post a follow up. Okay, um, getting back to what Clang can do. It has a lot of targets, so does GCC, but Clang has some interesting additional things like ta uh, targets for various GPUs. So that's interesting, especially if you're trying to do anything where you're trying to split workloads between the CPU and the GPU. Yeah, we already covered the next point in the question. There are special cases where one compiler will perform better. On average, the performance is similar. Clang is trying to be a drop-in replacement for GCC. So it implements a lot of GCC extensions. If you have some code that was not developed with standards in mind, that was developed only for GCC, there's a good chance it will work with Clang anyway. Not a hundred percent chance, but a pretty good one. And Clang was initially released in 2012, so it's eight years old. That uh, is pretty much a cause for a lot of differences we are seeing. It doesn't have to care about all the old standards and so that GCC keeps carrying around. It was built on a more modern base, but it also has to uh, catch up on a couple of things. GCC has been doing for almost 40 years longer. Another thing that differs between those two compilers is the license. GCC is GPL. Clang is Apache 2.0, which essentially means do whatever you like, except say you wrote it, which has both advantages and drawbacks. I mean, I personally prefer the GPL option uh, because it makes people contribute back. But if you're doing something very specific and you just don't want to bother releasing any code, you, you might opt for the uh, Apache licensed thing by default. But in terms of the compiler, that really shouldn't be a primary consideration. They are both open. They are both good. Pick whatever works better. And of course, there's a good chance you will need LLVM stuff anyway. It's used by Mesa and other things you uh, will probably want on a system unless you are building some very specific embedded device. And of course, there's also reasons why you might need uh, GCC anyway. For example, you might uh, want to have libstdc++ or libgccs. So whether or not the compiler you are opting for has all the things that you need for the system, 
you are trying to build is another consideration that you should be looking at. So one of the pieces of good news is that Clang and GCC are binary compatible. You can link a library built for, uh, by one compiler to a, a code uh, built with the other. And you can even mix them inside the same project. So you compile one object file with GCC and another with Clang, and you link them together and it will work. There's usually not much of a reason to do that. There might be some special cases. For example, if you've observed GCC optimizing one particular function a lot better and Clang optimizing another function a lot better, you might opt for a version where you compile the f file with that's optimized better with GCC with one compiler and you compile the other file with cl uh, Clang and then link them together to get the best performance. But usually the, uh, the performance differences are not big enough for that to matter. If you do want to mix compilers that way, you have to use GCC support libraries. Uh, so libgcc and GRT's version of the CRT object files um, because Clang can handle GCC's versions, but uh, if you want to use Clang's versions, so if you want to use compiler RT instead of libgcc with uh, GCC, it's possible, but quite a bit tricky. So that's something you probably want to avoid. Another alternative compiler is TinyCC, which, as the name already tells you, is one of the smallest implementations of the full C99 compiler you can get. The compiler source itself is smaller than four megabytes compared to multiple hundreds of megabytes for both GCC and Clang. And it takes only a few seconds to compile. I managed to compile TinyCC uh, in less than 10 seconds on a relatively fast box. But it doesn't optimize as strongly as Clang or GCC. And it's also limited to C. It doesn't support any of the other languages supported by the two other compilers. So no C++, no Fortran, no whatever else you might want to use. But it is certainly another interesting option for small embedded devices. And another interesting thing is uh, that you can embed the compiler and essentially make it use C as a scripting language inside your application. So even if you don't end up using it as the primary compiler for your project, it might be worth a look depending on what you want to do. Another interesting compiler, well, or at least another compiler that might be interesting at some point is OpenArc. So far it's Vaporware, but it was announced by Huawei last year. It's supposed to become a C, C++, Java, Kotlin, and JavaScript compiler that generates native code. And they promise it will be fully open at some point. But so far, they've only released a bit of code that can compile Java to ARC64 assembly. And it does that by calling into a binary blob. So uh, if you're interested in open compiler, there's not much there yet. But if they stick to their promise, it could really become an interesting option in the future, especially if you have to mix languages. But right now it's not there yet, and so we'll have to see whether or not it goes anywhere. Another option that you will probably have if you are working with embedded devices is using a board support package that comes with the board. But usually those board support packages contain a fork of a really outdated version of GCC or Clang. And usually both of those compilers have, in the meantime, already added much better support for the hardware in question than that fork that comes with the board might have. So unless you are working on a very special device there that is not yet supported by the upstream compilers, it's usually the best option to just ignore whatever is in the board support packages, maybe pick a couple of libraries or so from there, but ignore the compilers and just uh, go with the latest version of Clang or GCC. Sometimes that means you have to add a few kernel patches to uh, make sure whatever outdated kernel comes with the board supports the current tool chains. But those patches are usually already written because they exist in current kernels and they tend to be easy to find. So we can just look at the kernel Git repository and 
look at the log for the file that's refusing to compile. In general, I think it's probably best to avoid any compiler that is not based on GCC 8 or later or on Clang 9 or later. Earlier versions of those compilers are just not as good. So, summing it up, GCC and Clang are both good options. There's no clear winner. TinyCC is also interesting to look at depending on what you're doing, but just not uh, that great a general purpose compiler. Both of the big compilers have been used to compile full systems, now even including the kernel. Most Linux distributions that you are using on your desktop on a server will probably have been built with GCC. There's a few like Open Mandriva and Android and some of the BSDs that are built mostly with Clang. In some uh, distributions that like to build everything from source, you are offered both options. So both compilers have had a lot of testing uh, with all the standard open source components. So it's really hard to make a choice there. Clang makes it a bit easier to add new architectures, new languages. It is generally built as a library, so it's easier to embed parts of the compiler in your own code if you want to do that. If you're planning to add architectures or a new language in the front end, or you want to embed the compiler somewhere, chances are you'll be happier with Clang. On the other hand, if you're using glibc that currently can't be built uh, with anything but GCC, even though there's a couple of patches floating around, we'll get back to that a bit later. And if you don't need any of the extra of, uh, other extras offered by Clang, you may want to go with GCC for everything as well. They're really both good compilers. So let's look at the next component, which is libc, which is basically the core library containing such calls as open, close, and everything else that you will end up using in every application out there. glibc is the default option. It's what has been around forever. It's the most complete uh, libc out there. It's the most standard compliant version because it uh, really tries to support all the relevant standards out there, including the really old ones like C89. It has had a lot of testing because it was for a long time the only option. It has the most complete architecture support. I'm not going to read off the entire list, but if you care, just look at the slides or look at the glibc code. But it also has a couple of drawbacks. Its code is not very readable. It can only be compiled with GCC. So if you're opting for a different compiler, you will have to use GCC for glibc anyway. There is a set of patches that makes it compile with Clang, but uh, it's based on an old version of glibc, which is 2.29. So it might be an interesting project to uh, look at those patches and port them over to current glibc. Another drawback of uh, glibc is that it's not very optimized for small systems. It's rather big, so roughly four megabytes for LDSO, libc, libm, libp thread, which are the main components you will need anyway. Of course, if you are targeting a high-end desktop or a high-end server, four megabytes really don't matter. So that's not a big deal. But if you're targeting an embedded system or a low-end desktop, where you really want to save a lot of memory, like if you want to get anything to work on my old friend here, you probably don't want to use glibc. One alternative that has come up lately is Muzzle, which is interesting because it's also very complete. It's fast, it's relatively small, only 785 kilobytes compared to glibc's 4 megabytes. It was written with uh, C11 and POSIX 2008 compliance in, main, in mind instead of also targeting all the older standards but it does support a lot of commonly used uh, glibc and Linux and BSD extensions. So most of the code you see out there will compile against Muscle uh, without problems. It also has pretty good architecture support, not quite the full list that glibc has, uh, 
but pretty much all the interesting architectures are covered. In terms of architecture support, one really interesting thing in Muscle is that it's the only Libsy I've seen that uh, supports OpenRisk. I don't know if OpenRisk will ever really go anywhere, but it's an interesting architecture. And so far, if you want to use that architecture, you're stuck with uh, Muscle only. Another key advantage of Muscle is that it has readable code. So if you want to figure out how your Libc works, Muscle is probably the best option to look at. Uh, Glibc is rather complicated to understand. So as you see Libc, which is the next option, and Muscle has been around since 2011. So it looks like it's uh, there to stay, which is certainly a reason to consider it. Another option is UCLibCNG, which is another relatively complete, fast and small uh, Libc implementation. It's about one megabyte in a full config, but the interesting thing in UCLibC is uh, it can be stripped down easily. It has a make uh, config target that is just like the kernel's config, where you get a list of all sorts of optional features uh, optional functions that tend to be quite big. You can throw them out easily by just saying, okay, I want this and this and this, and I don't want that and that and that. So if you're building an embedded system and you're not using all the functionality from Libc, the, uh, and stripping out stuff is acceptable, then you see Libc ng might be an interesting project to look at. Another one is Klibc, which was written for early boot up process. Some distributions, most Debian derivatives use Klibc for their init RAMFS in early boot up process, which is what it was actually written for. It's only a subset of Libc functions optimized for size over performance. It uses kernel structures directly to avoid type conversions. So, for example, the kernel has its own idea of struct stat, and most libcs have their own idea. And when you uh, call stat in a libc, uh, there will be some conversion going on. Whereas in klibc, you just use the kernel struct stat, and it gets passed on. And this type of thing makes klibc extremely small. It's only 75 kilobit kilobytes, but it's not powerful enough to act as a real-world libc. Uh, it uh, doesn't have all the functions that you will need to compile a full system. It might be good enough for some embedded systems. And one thing to look out there is it uses GPL kernel headers, and that results in a kernel license situation that is not completely clear. So you might end up putting your entire system under the GPL, uh, making it problematic if someone wants to run any non-free applications on top of it, which of course, if you are trying to push open software heavily, might be a good thing. But if you are targeting people who might be doing anything, that's a reason to avoid it. There's another thing, much like the OpenArc compiler we've talked about before, this is Vaporware for now, but uh, there's some code there. It's the LLVM libc. It's in really early stages. There's some code you can look at, but um, it doesn't do a lot yet. I wouldn't usually have listed this because it's still in early stages, but it has some really interesting features, like it's designed from the grounds up to work with sanitizers and fast testing. So you will likely not end up running into all sorts of bugs that have been plaguing other libcs for decades. It's targeting only C17 and up, so you won't have to carry around all the prehistoric craft. And one design goal of it, given that it is just like the Clang compiler, a part of LLVM, is to, uh, to use source-based implementations, so write everything in the libc in the C itself instead of uh, going down to the level of writing assembly that you will find in most other libcs. And 
while edit fix the compiler to generate a code that is just as good as the handcrafted assembly code you will find in other libcs. So if nothing else, this libc will help make the compilers better. And of course, it does come out of a project that has a track record of delivering good options. So I'm pretty sure they will get there eventually. It's not like it's just some project that has sprung out of nowhere saying, okay, we are doing this and we will be better than everything else. And then it will disappear in a couple of days again. There is another option, which is uh, Bionic. If you've ever looked at Android source code, you have seen this one. It's originally based on the BSD libc. Uh, it contains some code from FreeBSD, some from OpenBSD, some from NetBSD, and some written for Bionic itself. It currently only supports the most relevant architectures, 32 and 64-bit versions of x86 and ARM. It is quite optimized because a lot of vendors put a lot of effort into optimizing Android. In the early stages, it used to be totally unusable for building a regular Linux system, like it didn't have System 5 shared memory, uh, which was needed for X11. But it has largely caught up on that, and it's by now a fully usable libc. But unfortunately, at the same time, they've added a lot of things to it that are really not existent in stuff outside of Android. So there's the Apex stuff, uh, which essentially tries to mount uh, any files as directories and look at what's in there, which is part of Android's package manager. And then there's system properties that last time I checked relied on Android's init implementation to work. And the build system is tied to the Android tree. And so it is kind of complicated to uh, rip out Bionic and build some non-Android system on top of it. But of course, Doing that gives you a couple of interesting options, like uh, using closed drivers that have been written for Android without having to go through hacks like the early libraries. And uh, it may be interesting if you're building the Linux Android hybrid system, which in some ways makes sense. There's uh, one comment in the Q&A which says actually Core Tool NG can build Bionic, so you don't need Android's build system. That's really good news. I'm definitely going to check that out. I must have missed that when it was added. And I hope it targets current versions of Bionic that could make things a lot easier. So I'll definitely check it out and maybe talk about that at the next DLC. <laughs> There's a few more options, but I'm not going to consider those for, for full libc's for a system. There's new lib, which is limited to static linking. So you might want to look at it if you don't need dynamic linking, but uh, pretty much everything except super low end embedded devices will want dynamic linking, which pretty much rules it out. And then there's diet libc, which is another very optimized for size libc, but it's not very actively maintained. The last release was, I think, two or three years ago. And another drawback of this one is the, uh, that it's GPL licensed, which for applications is great, but for something as low level as a libc is probably going a bit too, uh, too extreme because that puts your users into questionable situations if they want to run anything non-free on top of it, like, uh, trying to build Steam or something on top of uh, GPL libc would be problematic. So that's uh, probably another one you may want to look at if you have some special needs, but it's not as general purpose as the others. So what's the best choice to make? Again, there's no super clear uh, winner. If you need maximum compatibility with all the standards, uh, if you need binary compatibility with the big distributions out there, you pretty much have to go with glibc. If you need something full-fledged, but smaller, more memory efficient, you probably want to go with muscle. If you want to, uh, if all you need is a subset, 
and you can strip out unneeded components if it's clear what you won't be needing. You see, libcng might be an interesting choice because that makes stripping out parts easiest. And Bionic is uh, obviously interesting if you want to experiment with Android features or if you are looking at uh, code that has been optimized already by Android guys. Next up, we have C++ support. There's a couple of implementations of the standard template library, STL, uh, which is part of the C++ standard. The first option is libstdc++, which is part of GCC. So that is used by almost all the Linux distributions, even the ones that use Clang as their primary compiler. The only notable exception is Android. And I think the BSDs as well, but they are not a Linux distribution. So the, in the context of Linux distributions, they don't count. And pretty much everything that's being developed in the open world is developed against libstdc++. So if you want to avoid tweaking code by adding missing includes or something that happened to be ignored by libstdc++, this is what you want to use. But there's also libc++, which is part of LLVM, uh, comes with Clang. It's newer and smaller than libc++, uh, than libstdc++. It carries less craft uh, that's needed only to support ancient code. Most benchmarks show it performing better and also show it to be more memory efficient. But there's a problem there. You can't mix the libstdc++ and libc++ because they export the same symbols, but they're not uh, fully binary compatible. So you get into an interesting situation when you have, for example, Qt built against libc++, and then you grab a binary that was built on some other distribution with uh, Qt that was built against libstdc++, then that binary wants to call into functions from both uh, STL implementations, and that's not going to work, that's just going to crash. So if you expect running into a situation where your user will end up running third-party binaries built against something else, that's the main reason why you don't want to use libc++. That's why we aren't using it in Open and Reva, even though we'd like to. One interesting thing is that third-party applications like Chromium increasingly just embed their own copy of libc++. Obviously, they can do it because they don't expect anything else to link against their binaries. So they make sure that anything that is linked against it is uh, not linked against any system library that would be using a different STL. So if you want to go their way of essentially including an entire distribution in your binary, libc++ is certainly also a really good option. For the sake of completeness, there's UC libc++, which was an attempt for, uh, to write an STL implementation to go along with UC libc. The, uh, an interesting feature there is that you can uh, strip out some parts of the STL, but the last commit to it was in 2016, so there's a good chance you don't want to use this anymore. Um, we have some more questions. One is, can we use glibc or muzzle with Clang? The answer for muzzle is yes, it works with either compiler. You can probably even build it with TinyCC if you feel like it. I haven't tried it, but I don't see why it wouldn't work. And for glibc, the, um, the answer is not at the moment, but there's a couple of patches for an older version the, um, that make it sort of work. So if someone wants to port those uh, patches to current glibc, the, um, that would make it possible and that would definitely be interesting for the future. And I'll probably try to do that at some point, but right now I just don't have the time. The other one is um, how Muzzle provides better memory efficient libc. The, um, which I guess is uh, why is muzzle smaller than uh, glibc? Essentially, it's 
mostly by le uh, leaving out the support for older obsolete standards and by having smaller implementations of some of the functions. I hope that answers all the questions so far. Let's go on to the next thing. Conclusions for C++ support is essentially if binary compatibility uh, with other Linux distributions is a big concern, you really want to go with libstd C++ because that's what everyone is using. But if you're using Clang and you care about performance and memory efficiency more than compatibility, libc++ is something you clearly want to look at. Okay, lastly, we want to uh, take a look at what the right thing to do is in a distribution. Given there's no clear best option for everything, a distribution should try to support developers for all options. And I'm going to talk about some things we've already done in Open and River and that you can be doing in your favorite distribution as well. And a few things that we are planning to do in the next couple of versions that would also be good to be adopted a bit more widely. One thing you want to do is keep your cross compilers up to date. With Clang, that is something that happens automatically because the cross compilers are all in the same binary anyway. But with GCC, you often end up packaging one cross compiler and then leaving it there. It works, it works. And you update the system GCC, you update the system GCC again, and the cross compiler remains at the old version. That's just not the way it should be done. So the best way to do it is to build the cross compilers if you are packaging any from the same source as the main version of GCC. And that can be done quite easily. We figured out how to do it in the Open and River packages. If you want to see how we've done it, I've put a link to the uh, package source um, in the slides. This is using RPM, but obviously you can do the same thing with other package managers. And essentially the idea is simply using a for the, uh, loop that builds all the cross compilers at the same time from the same source with the same patches. So you will always keep your tool chains in sync. Next up is file system changes. We used to have the situation where there's just user lib and then some distributions added user lib 64, some uh, added user lib 32 to make sure that uh, 64 bit and 32 bit binaries can coexist. But that's really no longer sufficient. There's multiple ABIs. So for example, on ARM, you have one 64 bit uh, ABI, but there's multiple 32 bit, uh, like you have EABI versus the old ABI. You have neon versus non neon, and you might need to have more than two of those on one system. And of course, QEMU bin FMT is coming along really nicely, making it possible to run code for different CPUs without the user even noticing it. So if only you had all the libraries in the right place, you could run x86 Windows applications in Vine on an ARM box, and the user wouldn't even have to notice. So some distributions, most of the Debian derivatives uh, have already opted for a solution there. They are now creating user lib triplet. Uh, so you have, for example, user lib x86 Linux GNU and user lib ARC64 Linux GNU, which is a step in the right direction. But I think there's a way to do it even better, which is going for user triplet lib instead of user lib triplet because this allows combining the real uh, file system you have for the cross compiler sys root. So essentially your user ARC64 Linux GNU is at the same time the sys root for your ARC64 cross compiler and the place for libraries that will be picked up by QEMU if you try to run an ARM64 binary. And you can also put includes that are the not the uh, architecture independent, uh, for example, headers that uh, hard code 32-bit or 64-bit references in include directory the uh, 
that belongs there and you can override binaries for the couple of places where it's necessary to have different binaries. Thankfully, that's only needed for a few libraries. So for example, some older libraries don't use PKG config or so to find stuff, but they have some whatever library dash config binary uh, that gets all the information. And there you don't typically want to use the 64-bit version to compile a 32-bit binary or vice versa. In it, this type of file system change also uh, makes it possible to keep uh, all the compatibility with all the systems you want, because you can just create a sim link uh, that links the triplet slash lib the directory that you created in this change to, uh, to the traditional directory name, whether that was lib or lib32 or lib64. So that's pretty much what I had to say about uh, toolchain options. I'm still going to take questions, feedback, and obviously if you have any spare bags of cash. So now is a good time to ask, or you can email me or find me on the Slack channels in the conference. Okay, it doesn't look like we are getting more questions. Oh, it does something. Let me see. Ah, okay, there's, no, there's actually some questions coming in. I just didn't spot them because uh, the window was scrolled out. So one was, what does STL mean? That's the standard template library. That's just the, the uh, C++ standard library, so standard template library, libstd C++, libc++, all the same. So another question was, um, can glibc be built leaving out the older legacy functionality? Not by itself, but obviously if you're comfortable with, uh, tweaking make files, uh, editing stuff, uh, you can adjust it. The code is open, so if you want to do it, certainly you can. Next question: What do you think about function multiversioning to support uh, for support of multiple arcs in one binary? Is this a possible solution that could minimize OS file system size? I haven't actually seen an option that would allow the uh, multi-versioning uh, for completely different architectures, like that would allow a 64-bit ARM in a 32-bit x86 version of the same function in the same library. I might be wrong about this. I've certainly never seen it. But uh, the drawback of that, obviously, is that it makes it hard to strip out stuff you don't need. So, for example, if you're building the distribution for an ARM system and you want uh, Vine to run, uh, so you need x86, uh, 32, and 64. Um, there's no way the user uh, could just decide, I don't want to use Vine anyway, so let me just strip out all the x86 crap of the uh, from the library. So for this particular thing, uh, I don't think that's really much of an option. Obviously, it is interesting for stuff um, where you are targeting, for example, an Intel x86 and AMD x86 uh, with slightly different options, where most of the functions uh, can actually be the same, and you just want specific functions optimized for uh, for one particular processor. Okay, I think that's all of this. The, there's a couple more so-called questions saying the thank you. Well, of course, I'm returning that. Thank you all too. And 
I'll keep checking for messages for a bit. Okay, unless I've missed anything, the, uh, you got all the questions covered. So, thanks for attending. And, oh wait, the uh, new question just came in. Which is, is Clang supporting new instructions for ARM x86? The answer to that is uh, yes. It generally adds support for them quite quickly. Occasionally ahead of GCC, mostly a little bit behind GCC, but yeah, usually the uh, support is in quite quickly. You can use stuff like dash m arch equals uh, Zen version two or dash m arch equals um, Skylake or whatever. Okay, another one is. Um, any idea why build root doesn't support Clang yet? Mm, unfortunately, no. I have no idea, probably because the maintainer doesn't uh, like it or the, likes GCC better. But uh, I'm pretty sure if someone wants to, the, uh, they would take a patch. Okay, and there's another one. Any word on debuggers? Essentially, we have GDB, which has been the default for, for a long time. We also have LLDB, which is the version of uh, that comes with LLVM. The, um, essentially, the, uh, that is getting there as well. I haven't used it a lot yet, but it looks promising as well. So those two are certainly things to keep in mind. And I'm not aware of any options that are not based on either of those, but there might be any, uh, I just haven't had much of a need to go looking for anything else because GDB and LLDB do pretty much everything I need. Okay, I think I've caught up. So let's check for a second longer if there's new questions coming in. But I think we are done. Ah, there's another one. What would you say is the more stable variant of libc for embedded use? That's a good question. They are all pretty good. Um, so embedded use uh, obviously can mean anything from a Cortex-M to a relatively high-end device like a modern smartphone. And there it really makes sense to look at the exact things you need. glibc is obviously the option that has been used on everything for a long time. So that is a good default. But if you need to save more space, muscle is probably more interesting. Possibly also you see libc if you want to strip out parts. But if you're looking for a full fledged one, I'd go with muscle. Mm. If you're building a phone, then uh, maybe Bionic is also uh, an interesting option because uh, thanks to Android, that has a lot of, uh, that has had a lot of testing in that context. Okay, let's see. Okay, it doesn't look like new stuff is coming in right now, so I think we are done. And if you have, oh wait, there's another one. It's a comment saying, Muzzle is a nice option because of its MIT license. You can build static binaries without the constraints of the LGPL license. Yeah, that's true. Obviously, the, being an open source guy, I think that 
regardless of what the license forces you to do, you should be releasing your code. But if for some reason you can't do that, obviously the MIT license is another reason to go with Muzzle. Okay, so we've had a couple of questions, some feedback, no bags of cash yet, so you still m might want to send those. <laughs> ah, another thing coming in. Ah, just thanks. Well, thanks to you too. <laughs> okay, and then I guess we are done. Thank you for attending and Hope to see you at the next ELC, whether it's virtual or real. And have a nice rest of the day. And if you have anything else, feel free to uh, contact me by email or find me on the Slack channel, which would be two track Linux systems. <laughs>